Welcome to this tutorial which is going to look at the POP solver. And the POP solver is a way in Houdini to combine the POP context with Dynamics so that it allows you to use both the tools in the POP context but also the standard Dynamics forces to manipulate a group of particles. And in the second part of the tutorial I'm going to have a look at the kind of techniques that can be used to render out many millions of particles. And this effect, uh, smoke or ink-like effects, which you can achieve using millions of particles are pretty common these days. Uh, and Houdini is very capable of achieving those effects and we'll give you an introduction as to how that is done. To start with, I'm going to lay down something which we can use to emit our particles. And I'm going to use a sphere and I'm going to reduce the size of it and I'm also going to animate it uh, so that it uh, moves across the scene as we go from frame 1 to frame 40. So let's put it somewhere here and I'm doing the animation at the wrong level. Uh, let's go up to the scene level and do that again. So let's start it somewhere like that. Alt, left click to keyframe that. And then at frame 40, I'm going to Alt, left click again. And now this is going to move across as the frames advance. So I now want to lay down a pop network. And we need to establish the basics of our pop network before we then bring the POP network into the Dynamics context. So this is a POP network and I'm going to delete the file and lay down a POP network. And at the moment I'm not going to connect it to anything and I'm going to dive inside and lay down a source POP and I'm going to use the sphere as the source of our particles. I'm going to birth them from the surface of the sphere in a random order and I'm going to turn off impulse activation and I'm going to have constant activation and I'm going to give them an act a, a, a birth rate of 5,000 particles per second and I'm also going to create a birth group but I'm not going to tick preserve group, so this is just going to be the particles that have just been born. And I'm going to inherit the velocity of the sphere, but I'm not going to inherit the full velocity. I'm going to leave it at something like 0.6. So what we should see is that as our sphere moves along, a trail of particles is left behind it. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is make these particles move a little bit away from each other. And in order to do that, there are several different methods. The method I'm going to demonstrate here uses the interact pop, which uh, forces particles that are near to each other to fly apart. But uh, in some circumstances, it's better to avoid the interact pop. It can be quite slow to calculate and it's sometimes better to just use some forces attached to an object, uh, having an attractor object and so on. But for the purposes of this, let's use the interact pop. So the first thing I'm going to do is lay down a property. And what I'm going to do is add a charge to our particles. Now the degree to which they repel or attract each other depends on their charge. I'm going to delete the channel that's in here, and I'm going to give this little expression which depends on the life of the particle. So I'm going to have 2 minus dollar age and naught. So this means that dollar age is the life of the particle in seconds. So they will start with a charge of 2 and as the age advances to 2 seconds the charge will decrease and if age drops below zero, the charge will just be zero and the interact will have no effect. And I'm going to add a, another component just to make this a little bit random. And I'm going to give it 0.5 plus rand ID times 0.5. So 
So this is going to calculate a random number which will be fixed for every particle. That will remain constant. And times it by 0.5 and add 0.5. So this is going to give you a value between 0.5 and 1. And again, it's going to decline as the age of the particle increases. So let's now make these particles interact. So I need the interact pop. And I'm going to turn down the default values here so they're much smaller. So I'm going to use the supplied radius rather than the particle radius. And I'm going to give this a value of 0 0.05. And I'm going to use the supplied radius here and give this a value of 0 0.1. So this is going to reduce the effect only when the particles, so it only happens when the particles are very close to each other. And I'm going to increase the roll-off of the force that's created. In other words, it'll be much weaker. Uh, it'll decline more rapidly as the particles get further apart. And I'm going to make the force very, very small. I'm going to give us a value of, say, 0.03. Let's see what that does. And we can see that that's creating fairly gentle expansion of those particles away from each other. But we could see that those particles were potentially going to carry on flying away forever. So I'm going to lay down a drag pop. So that should slow uh, the particles down once they've left the area where they're actually interacting. And we can see that limits the effect these particles are not flying off as far as they were earlier. And the next thing I want to do is to split my particles into a series of groups. So I'm going to lay down a group node and I'm going to split just uh, the birth group and I'm going to split it into a series of groups in fact that I'm going to call mass group and I'm going to use the random tab here. And the random tab allows us to uh, create a fixed number of groups and randomly place our particles in those groups. And I'm going to use four groups. So we should now have four groups, each with uh, the equal, an equal number of particles in them. And remember, these are just the particles that have been born uh, this in this frame. So the next thing I'm going to do is lay down a property sop, pop rather, and I'm going to apply this just to the first mass group, and I'm going to set the mass of my particles. Let's delete this, and I'm going to give it a, this a very low value, and then I'm going to control C, control V that, to get a copy, and this time I'm going to apply it to mass group 2 and not to mass group 1. And I'm going to give this a mass of 0.5. And, and then I'm going to apply this to mass group 3, and I'm going to give it a mass of, say, 2. And then final one, applying just to mass group 4, where I'm going to give it a mass of 3. So what I've done here is divided our particles up into four different sets, which are going to have a different mass. We're going to have some heavy particles, uh, some lighter particles. And that's part of the technique for getting a nice dispersion of particles, as might happen in an ink flow or, or something like that. And as the final step in this pop network, before we bring this all into dynamics, I'm going to add some curl noise. And curl noise is one of the key nodes for introducing some randomness into the flow of these particles. And I, you'll need to experiment to see what uh, settings uh, you like best. I'm going to give ourselves quite a low frequency noise. I'm going to increase the turbulence a little bit. And I'm going to start by 
having it as a force effect and have a look and see what that does. I'm going to reduce this down to quite a small level and see what uh, see what that looks like. And we're getting quite a lot of we can see sort of movement randomized movement may not be quite what we want. Let's try updating the velocity instead and give it a little bit of random velocity. Let's try that uh, That's becoming unstable. So finally, let's try updating the position and see whether that uh, works. And that's producing quite nice movement. So I think we'll we'll leave it like that. So we're going to leave that updating the position. So the next step is to bring our particle system into the dynamic dynamics context. And the tool for doing this is here on the Create Particles tab. So I'm going to go up to the scene level and I'm going to rewind to the beginning. And I'm going to turn off the visibility of the sphere so I don't select it accidentally in a moment. And the tool we want is this Pop Object tool. So I'm going to hit that and then select our particle network and press enter. And that's created an auto dot network for us and it's laid down some nodes inside. The first node it's laid down is this pop object node. And a pop object node is a container which contains the geometry or the, the, the particles that uh, we're going to use. So if we have a look at a details view, we can see that our dynamic simulation only has a single object, which is this pop network object. And if we open that up, we can see it's got some geometry data, and that geometry data are all of our particles. And notice that you can set some of the physical parameters for your particles here on the physical parameters tab. The next thing that there is is this object position node. And all this is doing is ensuring that the particle network as a whole is transformed by any transformations that we have here at the scene level on our pop network. Now I don't have any such transformations, so I'm going to just disable that. And then we get our pop solver. And this is a very complicated uh, set of parameters, but let's summarize what they do. Obviously the pop path is a path to the pop network that we're bringing into the dynamics context. Uh, this tells the pop solver where new particles will be created, and in this case, this is the source node that we laid down, and it tells you the lifespan of any particles that are that are created. These uh, two tabs here essentially replicate the settings which are available on, or at least some of the settings that are available on the PopNet container itself here, and. If you're executing your pop network from within Dynamics like this, it's these settings here that will take precedence. And the random seed, obviously, is a way of affecting the outcome of the random parts of your particle network. Oversampling is the number of times the network is calculated at each frame. And the maximum number of particles, of course, limits the number of particles in the simulation. So I'm going to set the oversampling to 4 for the moment to produce a little bit more accuracy. And then the collisions tab is a way of deciding where collisions will be handled. Will they be handled within the POP network itself using the collision tools available there? Or will they be handled by the dynamic solvers here? And I'm going to turn off handle collisions because I'm not, in fact, going to have my particles colliding with anything. And then finally the solver tab tells the solver where to find the particle data and that's in the geometry of the incoming object as we saw. And then there's some very detailed 
controls which allow you to determine exactly which parts of the POP network are going to be executed as part of this POP solver. And then finally we've got some gravity attached at the end here. So let's see the effect of that. And we can see that our particles start falling down because of the gravity. And in fact, I'm not going to use gravity in this simulation, so I'm going to delete that node. But what I do want is a force which is going to force the particles upwards. So I'm going to lay down a uniform force. And I'm going to give it a value of 5 in the upwards direction. But I'm going to modify it by some noise. So I'm going to lay down a noise field connect this through to the data connector and I'm going to give it say a frequency of 2 I'm going to make it 2 octaves of noise and I'm going to generate scalar noise because we've only got the one component anyway and perhaps give it a very slight variation with time like so. Let's see what that does and we can see this is starting to cause our particles to float upwards like so, which is probably what you want for a ball which is emitting ink or something else like that. So the next thing I want to demonstrate is how to influence the behavior of our particles using a fluid simulation. So I'm going to lay down a smoke container and let's move it up a little bit. And I'm going to need a source for my smoke so I'm going to lay down a box, move this down and then expand it so it covers pretty much the whole of the bottom of our smoke and then I'm going to source from object and select a smoke container. And let's have a look and see what this has done inside our Autodep network. So we've got our box, which is the source of our smoke, being merged in here with everything else. It's being set as the source here. We've got our smoke and our particles being merged together. And I want to change something here because by default the tool set this up so that there's a mutual collide relationship between the particles and the smoke. And in fact, uh, I don't need there to be that relationship, so I'm going to set that to none. And then the uniform force is coming in, so that will be affecting the smoke. So let's see whether that's working out. And what we should see is the smoke beginning to rise up. There it is. Now, what I want to do next is to add a little bit of extra randomness to the movement of that smoke. So I'm going to, first of all, give ourselves some vortex confinement. And secondly, I'm going to add some verticals to the simulation. So I select the Seed Verticals tool. I then select the Fluid box and press Enter. And this will have created some vertical geometry. And I'm going to reduce this down to 500. But I am going to increase the radius of the effect of the verticals to 0.5 and the magnitude to 1. And what this should do is ensure we have some nice random movement inside our smoke simulation. And I need to visualize the velocity field. That's the thing that we're going to use to affect our particles. So let's do that. I'm going to go across to the velocity tab. I'm going to override the divisions and I'm going to turn off use streamers. And what we should see now is quite a lot of movement here because of those vorticals. We can visualize the vorticals themselves. There they are. 
and we can see that there's a reasonable amount of movement. So that's going to swirl up our simulation quite nicely. And that's uh, in a moment going to affect the particles. It isn't yet. So let's turn off visualization of velocity. And I'm going to turn off the visualization of density because, in fact, uh, we're not going to be using the smoke simulation for anything other than to affect the particles. And while I remember, I'm going to turn off the display of the smoke object so that it won't render. So the sole purpose of the smoke simulation is to affect our particles. The other thing I want to do just to liven up this smoke simulation a little bit is to bring our ball in as a rigid body object which is going to affect and collide with the smoke. And this will give us a realistic effect if, if we had a, a ball that was emitting some ink forcing its way through a liquid then the ball itself would be affecting the movement of the liquid. So let's select our sphere and make it a rigid body object and that will have introduced it into our auto.network but I in fact don't want it to be simulated as a rigid body object I want it to be animated according to the animation that I've got here on this node. So what I want to do is deactivate the object and this is on the drive simulation tab here so I've pressed the deactivate tool it asks me to select a dynamic object I'm going to select my sphere and press enter and let's enlarge the auto.network and have a look and see what we've now got. It's getting quite complicated. This is the sphere that we've just brought in, which is attached to a rigid body solver. And the deactivate tool has created this key sphere object node, which, as you will know if you've seen my tutorial on keyframes and dops, by default will bring in the animation from the scene level and use that to move the object. So what we should see is that object moving. Now at the moment uh, it is being merged in here with everything else and everything is colliding with it. Uh, that's in fact all right um, because although we don't want the particles to collide with it and I'm pretty sure that they are not uh, we can make sure that on our pop solver the handle collisions is turned off and that will ensure that our collisions are not going to be handled by DOPS so the, the sphere and the particles will not collide and you can see they're no longer colliding there but it will be colliding with the smoke and if we turn on visualization of velocity we should see, it's a bit hard to tell, let's turn off visualization of the particles briefly. Looks like there isn't a control to turn that off. But if we could see behind here, we would see that uh, the presence of our sphere is in fact moving uh, these, the, the smoke and creating some movement here.